Good evening, everyone, and welcome to E2E Network webinar on AI in Emerging Media Technologies with Francesca Tabor. I'm Tanya, and I'll be your host for today. This webinar is brought to you by E2E Networks Limited, India's leading GPU provider. Let me now take a moment to introduce you to our speaker for today, Frankie Tabor. Francesca Tabor, affectionately known as Frankie, is an AI educator, innovator, and consultant with over 15 years of experience at the intersection of emerging technologies, creative industry, and business strategy. She specializes in large language model, large visual model, responsible AI, and AI ethics. Her expertise in leading large language model, training projects, product management, IT project management, and AI-powered event management sets her apart in the field. Now on to the main event. Frankie, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. So I am here in London um, and um, today I'm going to be um, talking specifically about the fashion industry. So I'll quickly share my screen. Um, so I've got a community called Fashion AI, which has 27,000 um, followers who take part in uh, weekly AI fashion competitions using things like Midjourney, uh, Leonardo, um, Stable Diffusion to create new fashion designs. Um, I've spoken in Sri Lanka, uh, all over the world around AI and, and fashion. And of course, fashion is quite a broad uh, topic as uh, you will come to find today. Um, so first, looking at the luxury fashion industry, how is that going to be impacted? So originally, fashion trends were defined by, um, you know, thought leaders and taste makers, um, and they were defined almost, you know, years in advance, um, and and then runways and uh, fashion shows would then, you know, announce to the world these are the the trends. Um, that has changed um, quite significantly with social media, um, so. Um, a number of these old elites um, are no longer the sort of tastemakers of trends. Um, so what causes some luxury fashion brands to survive and proliferate? Because these are really old institutions um, that have had to adapt over the times and go through various different economic crises, crises wars, um, and survive and rebrand themselves. And what causes some of them to decline over the decades? So declining fashion brands um, are... Fashion brands such as Burberry that let me see if I can pause this. Um, so brands such as Burberry uh, licensed out their fashion brand and they licensed out all of the patents and um, the check. Um, and they created these diffusion lines, so a cheaper version of the Burberry fashion line. So one was in Spain um, and then also in, in Asia Pacific more generally. And what happened is the products that were made more cheaply then found its way back to the UK market and then started to adorn um, what uh, British people affectionately call chavs or chav culture, who are sort of the football hooligans, um, all of these C-list celebrities who stay out late and drink a lot and take drugs and things, and really started to taint the brand overall. So this is an example of what a brand should not be doing. It shouldn't be licensing out its brand um, and cheapening the brand. Um, and so if we look at now generative AI, there are lots of artists and creators who can put text prompts and create a uh, and sort of um, an example of like a Balenciaga or a Gucci or a Louis Vuitton and create um, a, a new form of fashion and start to, to cheapen the brand. Um, so we might get brand dilution and even copyright issues as people start to create products and then create even more kind of counterfeit goods. Um, we've seen a rise of different platforms where you can buy secondhand goods um, and often you will find a lot of um, counterfeit goods posing as the real thing on these secondhand platforms. So these are some of the risks 
that luxury fashion brands have to contend with, with AI and generative AI. Um, now looking at ways that fashion brands can really survive and thrive in this space. Um, so luxury fashion brands need to hone in on their heritage, on their craftsmanship. Uh, they need to make sure that the artisan skills survive and are passed down through the generations and so that they can focus on quality and luxury. And of course, those things can't be replaced by AI. And the next thing they can do is focus on the creative aspects to really um, show themselves as exclusive art pieces. So they can invest in great creative directors who have a lot of vision and aren't just thinking about the fashion pieces, but thinking about the overall concept of a fashion store or collaborating with a very well-known artist. So this is an example of a collaboration between Yayo Kusuma um, and Louis Vuitton. And what can then be done with generative AI, here's an example that my team at Fashion AI created where we created um, a product line inspired by Yayo Kusuma. So we created shoes and handbags and fashion with all sorts of funky shapes. Um, and then we also created the pop-up store. What would that look like? The interior design, the architecture of that store to make the whole thing as cohesive as possible. So with generative AI, these luxury fashion brands can begin to collaborate with artists and create these unique exclusive collections. Here is the um, exteriors, and then we've got some of the interiors, uh, which are really fine. And what we did is, Obviously, we didn't have the budget to create a retail store, but we could um, use Unity and Unreal Engine to create those environments and create a sort of a simulated game immersive environment. And I really think that um, our e-commerce experience will shift from being a 2D experience where you're searching brand and price and color to being an immersive game-like experience. Um, as soon as our computers um, are more performant and that then becomes the norm. So then the brand experience is a journey where you're going into a new world and you're going into the world of that brand. Um, consumer brands are brands which are more focused on uh, a younger demographic. So think of Nike, think of Lululemon, and by its their very nature, they have to therefore... Um, cater to a, a younger demographic whose trends are always changing um, and influenced by things like Bollywood and film, music, um, different culture, sports, all sorts of cultural um, aspects that will filter into what is trendy for this younger demographic. Um, so one great place to find trends is on social media and to also look at influencers, also to look at things like fandom. Obviously, there are people like Taylor Swift who have hordes of fans around the world. Uh, there are people who are into anime. Um, uh, for example, here we've got the Harajuku Japanese streetwear culture. And this came out as, as quite a phenomenon um, at the Harajuku culture. And the reason why it was so controversial at the time is Japanese people in general are very um, polite and quiet and reserved and um, they conform a lot uh, to certain different rules. And so this was a new emerging rebellious culture that emerged, this streetwear culture, because young people weren't able to get jobs in traditional enterprise. So they became freelance, creatives, digital nomads, uh, and started to embrace that and their creativity and their freedom. And that was then expressed in what they wore. Also at the time, um, there was a lot of influence from America and the sort of individualistic spirit that Americans have, um, which also contributed to the Harajuku culture. So this just goes to show that what we wear, especially when it comes to young people, young people are trying to express who they are as people, what their values are. And it goes a lot deeper than um, 
than just a superficial what they're looking like and trying to fit in and um, to be socially acceptable. It also touches on politics, culture. And so you really have to understand um, the times. You have to listen to music, understand the lyrics, um, understand the spirit of the times. What are their challenges as young people? And what, what are they aspiring to be? We all know that young people nowadays they aspire to be influencers on YouTube and and um, to go off and and be independent in, in that way. Not everyone, but um, a large majority of young people do. Um, and then there are tastemakers. So you'll have um, celebrities on Netflix um, who are defining um, the trends as well on TikTok, etc. Um, so with AI, you can um, scrape data from social media platforms, and then you can use social listening and natural language processing um, and classifications to start to um, identify intent. Um, if you are a marketeer, you can start to segment your users and your, you can segment users obviously by demographic, which tends to be their geography. So where are they in the world? Um, are they single? Are they married? What age are they? Those, those are all of the qualities of demographics. And then you've got psychographics. Um, so ocean is one technique where you can look at the psychographics of people. Um, and that stands for O is for openness. C is for conscientiousness. E is for extroversion. A is for agreeableness. And N is for neuroticism. So if you were following Cambridge Analytica and what they did, they had these quizzes on Facebook. And so you would say, what Disney princess are you? For example, all of these fun quizzes, people would answer them and then they would identify your um, your psych psychographic profile and then they would target you with political ads. So if you are highly neurotic, you would be someone who is, you would respond to fearful content. So they would post lots of fearful uh, political ads at you. And that was a big scandal at the time. Um, however, for marketing, um, it can be quite helpful um, for understanding your, your audience. Uh, Style Lumia, they do this already really well. So they will um, take the, the shape of the garment um, and then combine it with the trend or the print. So it might be a color or a print and then create the final output. So this is an example of big data being and trend data being used to create new fashion designs. And then of course you can A-B test this. You can um, either create ads, you can get um, influencers to promote these designs and see what the response is before putting things into production. Um, here's an example of real-time video try-ons, uh, which uses post estimation. Um, you already see uh, the, the nascence of this technology with things like filters on Instagram. Um, and in general, kind of the virtual try-on um, technology is very good at understanding our face. So it's really good at, um, you know, a, a virtual try-on sunglasses or lipstick or earrings or a hat because we use our mobile phones and it understands our, our face. When it comes to the full body where you have to place your mobile phone further away and it would probably be, be better with a smart mirror, with a mirror with a camera in it, um, that then really needs to understand your full body and you need to therefore be wearing um, sort of clothing where you can see the shape of your body, you can see the movement because it uses pose estimation to therefore place the garment on you. Um, and what's really hard to do is to get the garment to move naturally. So if it's a heavy garment, you want the physics of the movement of the fashion to move like as a heavy garment. But if it's silk and it's floaty, then you need um, the physics to change slightly. And what you certainly don't want to do is you don't want someone to be walking and then their leg to sort of come out of the clothing. Um, so those are all of the considerations for virtual try -on. So we're not quite there yet, um, but the potential of virtual try -ons is, is huge. And we even saw it, you know, back in the 90s with um, the film Clueless, where uh, the main character woke up, she had her wardrobe there and she could see all of the different outfits that she could wear. 
Um, in order to enable um, virtual try-ons, you need to have a big, big data set um, and you need to annotate that data set correctly. Once you have that, and you not only have the images from the front of the garment, but also the sides and the back of the garment, you can also create these 3D reconstructions, which then enables you to put it on a human being of different shapes and sizes. And that's a really important thing because we will have data sets of fashion being worn by supermodels, but not everyone is as tall and as skinny as a supermodel. And so we also need to make a big effort to create data sets that are more inclusive and representative of different shapes and sizes, whether you're incredibly small or you're pregnant or you're in a wheelchair, we need to um, really be conscious about what data we're creating and making sure that we're um, creating these AI tools so that they're performant for everyone and inclusive. Then we've got designers. So I've been working a lot with designers um, recently. This is an example of a prompt um, for creating fashion. So you might start with the model. So who are they? How would you describe them? Their ethnicity, their pose. You might even want to reference um, a famous um, supermodel. When you are referencing either supermodels or fashion brands, you do need to think about the ethical considerations there because you are kind of licensing out either the name, image, and likeness of the uh, model or the style of the fashion brand. So if you were to go on to try and commercialize that piece of artwork or photo or to turn it into a piece of fashion, and suddenly you had that fashion brand saying, this looks like a knockoff of Gucci, and they ask for your prompt and you've got Gucci in your prompt, you might be in trouble. So for entertainment purposes, I would say, it is more effective to use references of um, famous people and of fashion brands that are well known. You'll get a better result. However, if you are trying to commercialize this, you need to start moving away from that and training your own data sets with your own style. Uh, and so then you've got the fashion. So uh, garment, color, material, reference. So this is an effectively information architecture. If you're to look at a car, how would you, if you were to do the information architecture and create the database, how would you define what that car is? Is it the model, the color, the size of the engine? Um, if it's first hand, second hand, all of those aspects. So information architecture is actually a really important part of the prompt engineering process. Then we've got here, we've got the setting. So where is it? And the lighting conditions. And then the last part is, um, the photographer itself. So who is the photographer? Um, so if you are doing a fashion prompt, you might want to look up some fashion photographers. What is the aspect ratio and what is the camera? Um, so actually photographers are really good at um, visual prompt engineering because they understand the terminology of depth of field, of lighting, of different camera lenses, and they will therefore get a photorealistic response. Whereas early on with tools like Mid Journey, you would often get kind of um, anime style, uh, kind of cartoonish um, style images. Now it's changed a lot and, and most of the images are photorealistic. Um, so here are some examples of um, the winners from the Fashion AI competitions. Um, so there are cash prizes. We also get sponsorship from different fashion brands who then can take those designs and turn them into physical collections. Um, and so you can find um, us on www.fashionai.pro. Um, and then if you scroll down to the bottom in the footer, you'll find the Discord channel, which is where um, you'll find the majority of the community. We also did some really interesting things with um, with makeup and contemporary uh, jewelry designs as well. Um, and here are selection of different images and the prompts. This was from a sort of underwater um, competition that we did, which was themed Atlantis. Uh, 
Um, and then what I've seen emerging are smaller communities that are really trying to represent a specific group. Um, so in this case, it was the African um, creative AI community. Already you can see there are stereotypes that are starting to emerge um, with Midjourney, even with ChatGBT. So not all Africans are in the middle of a desert and not all Africans look in this in this way. Um, so again, um, fine tuning is really important to get the right response. And then we've got hijabs as well. Um, and I've got lots of women within the fashion AI community who are from the Middle East, um, who are very repressed in, um, you know, the real world, but then um, online, they can really express themselves and they can create some beautiful pieces of art um, and new forms of, of fashion pieces and, and these beautiful hijabs. But already here, you can see um, the women here are blonde and blue eyed. Is that a, a reflection of our beauty standards? Certainly not a reflection of real sort of cultural sensitivity. Um, so having a human in the loop is, is quite important um, to make sure that the output is culturally sensitive to um, whoever you're, who's going to consume this content at, in the end. Um, and this was a competition that we held. We held a month long competition around sustainability. Um, so various different themes um, such as recycling, upcycling genes, um, save the rainforest in Amazon. And people were really um, having a lot of fun with creating um, fashion inspired by nature and um, being activists and promoting the message of sustainability. And then you can see here our sponsor, um, Olga Green um, from the fashion brand Ekolska, who then went ahead and bought the jeans, uh, recycled material, and actually created the outfit, um, which can be bought, and then the proceeds were given to charity. Some other tools for designing fashion include Refabric, which is great for fashion brands because they're um, collaborative elements and you can also fine tune refabric if you're a fashion brand you can also go in and um, create specific textiles and textures and patterns um, so there's a lot more sort of fine tuning and um, ability to control the end output whereas I would say mid journey is more creative it's more surprising the results so if you are super creative um, I still prefer um, tools like Midjourney, but if you are working in a professional capacity, I would definitely look at tools like Refabric. And then there is uh, New Arc AI. So this uses what's known as in-painting. So you can see a sketch here, and then it is in-painting within the sketch, um, you know, the colors and maybe creating various different um, variations which then can kind of go out and people can vote on, on what they like. And, you know, you can AP test um, those designs. Um, so this most probably uses stable diffusion and control net under the hood to create these results. After that, once you've got the images, you can animate them with tools like Pika Labs. And if you look at this video in particular, you can see where the light is coming from. You can see it reflecting off the dress. You can see how light the clothes are and even the hair of the model is moving. And this just goes to show how advanced these tools are becoming. Um, and this is just the first incarnation. We haven't even seen Sora yet, so that it will be really interesting to test this out with Sora if it can take an image from a journey, let's say, and then animate it. And then here's an example of a digital fashion show using stable diffusion um, and uh, runway ML and compositing and pose estimation. So they had various different models that used pose estimation to um, co composite on the fashion. And then um, they created, created lots and lots and lots of images in order to create this video where it's mixed reality with a kind of a film of a real fashion show with these AI models and AI fashion being shown. Um, 
this was created about a year ago. So again, um, we've come on a long way from this, but this is a, a great example. Next, we've got prints. Um, so with Midjourney, you can create seamless tiles, uh, which is really important because you need the print to seamlessly repeat in order to be an effective print. Um, so tile is one parameter that you can use. Um, then you can use stylize. So here you can see the, um, the prompt was woodblock print of folk art, geometric design. And so initially you've got S which stands for stylize. You've got AR, which is aspect ratio. And then you've got tile. So initially you have an unstylized version. Then the next one along, it's stylized 100% uh, by 100 and then by 250. And you can see it sort of moves away from the original prompt as you stylize it more and more. And then here is another parameter, which is Niji, which is influenced by anime. Um, so initially it's Niji 5. The second one is also Niji 5, um, but you have styles within Niji. So the first style is expressive. Then we've got scenic. And then the last one is cute. And with the cute one, you will have little animals appear and little fluffy clouds and um, smiley faces. Um, so if you were to sort of zoom in, you would find those little cute um, elements which are inspired by anime. Um, then you can create a, a blank of a model wearing a dress or a t-shirt. Um, you can also input the graphic design um, and the print into Midjourney and get Midjourney to explain what it sees. So this is a really important part because we are translating the visual to text using computer vision. What is Midjourney seeing? And then you can see here it says, cute white flowers on a rose pink background in the style of pop art, cartoonish images, bold color, 1960 simple forms, bold graphic design, wallpaper, playful, conceptual. Most people wouldn't write that initially as a prompt. And that's why sometimes it's helpful to first put the image, get the prompt back from a journey and then start to tweak around and change uh, these parameters to see what the results are. Um, so this is using the, the prompt to describe. Um, and then here is the, the end process. So you can describe um, the, the, the pattern. Um, you can create a fashion image of a white garment, um, and then you can add the actual um, print to that end garment. Um, by using, what you can see here is you can see HTTPS, so they have basically added the, um, the text of um, the model wearing the white t-shirt and the image of the model wearing the white t-shirt, the text of the pattern, and the image of the pattern and combined it together to see what, what happened. Uh, and you can create more and more variations until you until it gets it's correct um, to, to get to your end result. Then we've got Fabricator, which is a generative AI tool for creating um, more fabrics. Uh, and it comes with a PRB map, so you can then take this out and um, apply it to um, digital fashion um, to then bring it into game environments or these immersive environments. Um, and Fashion AI really started in the digital fashion side, which is where fashion brands would license their brand to be in, in games like Fortnite. Or if you work in the, in the textile industry and you have physical um, textiles, you can then digitize them by photographing them, inputting uh, data on the physics of the material, um, and then slowly but surely it will help you create those PRB maps, which is the digital equivalent of those textures, which then can go into training a model specifically for those textures. So when you are prompting and you're saying that you want a specific type of wool, you will get the specific type of wool. The issue with most of these tools today is it doesn't understand the full length and breadth 
of fashion terminology. It doesn't understand all the different colors. It doesn't understand all the different materials. So we still need to go in and fine tune these tools to be um, accurate and responsive. If you enjoy making patterns, you can sell them on uh, platforms like Spoonflower, which can be used for fashion, for wallpapers, for creating home decor items, and so on and so forth. Um, you can also find a micro factory like Cornet to do um, to print out the pattern. Next, let's have a little look at manufacturers. So we are going to see a huge amount of digital transformation from manufacturers on things like predictive analytics. So demand forecasting of specific trends, looking at historic data or looking at real time data on social media. Um, Internet of Things is where everything within the uh, manufacturing facility and production line will have sensors um, and will be able to move around. So think of the an Amazon warehouse with all of these robots moving around and packing and, and shipping and moving things around. Then we've got uh, blockchain. Blockchain is really important for tracking the supply chain process. Usually you have a QR code or um, some sort of code that you can scan. And at each stage within supply chain, it will, it will track what's happened to that item. Um, artificial intelligence uh, and blockchain. So lots of different types of technologies are all going to impact supply chain management. Um, and when it comes to making this process more efficient, you need to look at which decisions within the supply chain are making the most impact. And then you can see if you can automate or optimize those decisions um, using machine learning and, um, and slowly improving over time using big data. I'll skip past these aspects because they're slightly technical, um, but if you're into supply chain and logistics, you can look up things like the theory of constraints. Um, and then you can move from the theory of constraints to looking at the information supply chain. So we're not only talking about when we're looking at the supply chain, we're not only looking at the, the movement of physical goods, we're also looking at information flowing. And we need to make sure that the information is correct as it moves from one department to the next, to the next, to the next. Um, and that it's frictionless and that it's real time um, and it's not manual, it's all automated using things like computer vision and, and th so on and so forth. And these are all different systems. You might have an ERP system, an inventory system that they, they all need to link together. And once you have that, you then have the value chain. So the value chain is made up of the physical the goods moving through the supply chain system, you've got the information moving through that system. And then of course, you've got cash flow as well, whether it's paying suppliers or employees. Um, and there will be some really interesting things that happen in the cash flow space. So as we look to moving towards a more sustainable fashion line, we might want to, instead of predicting trends a year in advance and producing a lot of inventory and having the inventory in warehouses and if it's not sold, burning it all. Instead, why can't we use generative AI to test out ideas, uh, to see what the demand is, to use fast fashion, but not fast fashion in a way that's detrimental to sustainability, and then allow people to pre-order, order it before it's even made. Yes, the consumer will have to wait, but if they know that they're being more sustainable in the process, I think it's only natural that we will move in, in that direction. Uh, risk management is a big one as well. Um, introducing AI can actually introduce a lot of risks. Um, so if we can use AI to reduce those risks and provide early warning um, signals, that can be really, really beneficial. And then we've got warehousing and supply chain operations, robots. Um, so there is there are quite a few different robots for um, for fashion manufacturing and garment manufacturing. One of them is Subo, 
Um, so what it does is it will chemically stiffen the garment so that it can manipulate it and uh, produce the finished product. And then we've got Sue Boss, um, which can, it uses computer vision to analyze and correct distortions in the fabric. Uh, and it can cut and sew and add fabric. Um, and it does the QA testing as it's going along. And as you can see here, for just £5,000 per month, it can create capacity of 1 million products. So will these robots start to replace humans in the assembly line? Maybe, maybe in places like Japan, where you've got, um, you know, an aging population, for example, uh, and less, you know, young people, young people willing to work in factories, maybe in those countries, um, they might start to, to use robots. Also countries in Scandinavia, like Norway and Sweden, we've seen a, a huge adoption of these technologies. Just if you look at the demographics and um, uh, the sort of economics of the country, you can kind of predict which countries are gonna adopt this first. Product traceability, so this stems from sustainability and using blockchain. Um, there are some standards, so we can see the ISO standard, which is obliging um, fashion brands to now trace its data. Um, so that's really, really beneficial, um, but it's quite, con and it will be beneficial for the end user as well to be able to see the full supply chain and what it means from an environmental standpoint. And hopefully that will then impact their buying decisions. And what I find really interesting within the space is a move from a con from basically consumers buying from brands to consumers buying directly from manufacturers. So what happened before is the brand would buy from a manufacturer and say the product only cost $3 to make, and then the brand would sell it for $200 to the end customer. And manufacturers have known this for a while, but they like the safety of having the orders coming in from the brands. However, because of social media, because of technology, manufacturers more and more can go direct to consumer um, and sell through influencers on say TikTok. Um, so this is an emerging trend. And you even have some manufacturers that are going as far as to create their own brands. So Halara is one example. Um, so Lululemon, which is a very famous fitness brand, they clearly didn't have an exclusive license with the manufacturer because the manufacturer has then gone and taken the fitness style garments and created their own cheaper version of the brand very similar to what I was talking about before with Burberry. And, and now um, Lululemon are saying that they have such a problem with these, they call them counterfeit goods, um, but they're sort of competitor goods, um, that they are saying, bring in your counterfeit good to Lululemon and we will replace you with the, the real thing. So they, they want to uh, obviously stop that from happening. Um, but of course, this is a huge opportunity for manufacturers because they then can grow um, in, in profit and revenue, and that then goes back to their workers, and they can increase the wages of their workers. So if you're looking at CSR, corporate social responsibility, it's also about looking after people. And if you increase wages, you can, it means that their workers can send their children to school, or better schools, having health insurance, all of these elements, which are also a really important part of um, the CSR objective. Um, Shane is a really good example of a company that uses big data and trends um, to very, very quickly create these new uh, garments in response to trends. However, they have had issues where they have produced um, ne a necklace, for example, with a swastika on it, um, which and the swastika is, you know, symbolizing the, the Nazi movement. Um, they've also created praying mats, not really understanding Islam or various different religions. And that goes to show that yes, AI can do a lot, but humans still need to be in the loop 
um, and especially humans who have a high degree of emotional intelligence and a high degree of cultural sensitivity of understanding different people's cultures, religions, languages, beliefs, in order to do quality control of the, the output of the AI. Um, we've talked a little bit about this in terms of pre-orders um, and, and how that can really help um, with sustainability. Then we've got R&D. Um, so we certainly see an emergence of 3D printing. I'm really excited about 3D printing, being able to use recycled plastics. Um, a lot of garments uh, that get thrown away end up in in Africa in these huge, huge piles, uh, which is an environmental hazard if the garment was made using toxic materials that they then either go into the air and they become a biohazard for anyone breathing it in, or it can leach into the water system and poison the water system. So it's a huge issue. Um, so if we could take those plastics and we could create modular designs that people could wear, and then they can send them back and they get reconfigured into a new form of fashion that becomes really exciting. And of course, then you get these really fun structural pieces. Um, so you can see some sort of parametric designs here, wings. Um, these are all of the fantastical things that AI can, can produce. I've also seen a trend with bioluminescence, again, influenced by anime culture, gaming culture, brave music culture as well. Um, and I've done some research into bioluminescence. You can create it synthetically, but it's very toxic for the environment. Um, and you can also create this with natural materials, which you will find in, um, in fungi, for example, in the deep dark parts of the Amazon rainforest or in the deep dark parts of, of the ocean where they, um, these um, organisms don't have access to light. So they develop these bioluminescent qualities. However, obviously it's very hard to extract and costly. Uh, next, we've got the retail stores. So AI can be used to detect people coming in and out, their demographics. You can't check their psychographics, but you can certainly check their sentiment. Are they smiling? Are they angry? Who are they coming with? Um, and you can look at the flow of people within your store. So you can then start to reconfigure your store so that people stay for longer. Um, generative AI can be used to create these concept stores. So again, going back to luxury fashion brands who have these creative directors, they can think more broadly beyond the fashion to a world. Think of being a set designer. Um, and this is a good example of Rick Owens on Mars. And what would that fashion store look like? Then we've got a Balenciaga ice store, the Dior Aquarium, the Gucci tree house. Um, next, we've got immersive LED walls. Um, so these walls can, again, transport you to a different form of world. If you can combine this with 360 sound, with sensors where you touch a wall and it responds to you with these um, smart mirrors which are tracking you and you can see a digital twin of yourself wearing the fashion. These are all sorts of things that retail stores can help to kind of gamify these stores because people aren't going to physical stores anymore. They're buying online, spending time in games, on social media. So fashion brands who want to create an experience and want people to come back, they really need to think about investing in these new technologies, maybe even having a DJ in the store, uh, keeping the store open till late, doing events, all of these sorts of things are really gonna help to bring back the football into these spaces. But if you've got these large LED walls, you have to think about the pixels of, of the content. Most of the content that we produce today is very low quality for YouTube and performance and for our mobile phones and social media. So in order to um, scale that up, you can actually use generative AI upscalers to improve the quality and to recolorize things and to even bring archive footage from the past, which is black and white, and turn it to color. Um, so that's the benefit of generative AI for improving quality of these media assets. Uh, then we've got um, e-commerce. 
So by using computer vision, you can then start to create information architecture of all of the different products, which then means as a user, you can go in and you can search for satin, green, plain, wedding, whatever it is, and it will identify the right product for you, even if the words within the product description didn't include those words, because it would understand it from the images and the metadata associated with those images. Um, and so this is what it looks like. So natural language processing is all about looking at the text, the video, the audio, um, looking at entity extraction um, and the relationships or the ontology between these different objects. And if you have a marketplace like Etsy, Etsy have very, very unique trends um, such as romantic, geometric, minimal, tropical, mid-century that you really wouldn't find on other platforms. So they had to come up with their own categories. And once they came up with that, they could then improve the search and discovery on the platform. And then they could track those trends over time. Um, so they could see at certain times of the year in certain locations, perhaps, you know, in the summer, people more into uh, romantic or tropical um, style fashion, but in the winter, they might be more interested in mid-century. And of course, different times of the year, whichever hemisphere you're in, you might be in summer or winter. So it's not uniform across the globe. It's based on the geography. Um, and then we've got AI product recommendations. So as we move away from e-commerce search, we will move to chatbots where you can have a conversation with a brand and you can have products recommended to you. A really important part of this is retrieval augmented generation or RAG, where it will um, use real-time data from databases to give you the correct information in terms of products and pricing. If you have the incorrect data, it will make up a product, it will make up a price and it will bullshit really well and you'll believe it. And then of course the customer service team will have to field all of those complaints from people who said, well, you said that this beautiful dress is going to only cost $2 and actually it's $3,000. What's, what's going on here? Um, last but not least, we've got advertising. So you can start to use AI models. Um, Levi's actually got a bit of backlash from using AI models. They wanted to make their campaigns more diverse, but then people said, well, why aren't you hiring actually diverse models. Um, why are you using AI models? This is a little bit un unfair here. So using AI can be controversial. And we've actually seen a lot of um, advertising agencies that are now banning the use of these AI tools. It's mainly because of IP issues and infringement and not being able to own the end output for generative AI. You can't copyright it because it's created by a model. It's created by all of the data that went to training the model. Um, so the only thing you own really is the prompt and anyone can write that prompt. So it's, you can't copyright that. And then you can uh, A-B test. Um, so version A or version B, which one's going to perform better. And you can also storyboard adverts. So you can use ChatGBT to say, I'm creating an advert for um, a perfume. Um, please storyboard this with the visuals, then you can go into mid journey, create those visuals, and you can use Pika Labs or one of, or Runway to um, create um, a low quality version of the advert. So then when you go to shooting the advert in the real world, you've got a reference to use. I think this is, these are the last slides here. So this is to do with influencers. Um, so Influencers used to be um, sort of sports ambassadors like Michael Jordan. I'm not sure if you've seen the film Air, but it's a really interesting movie because influencers such as sports ambassadors used to be like models. They were paid to promote um, a garment, but they didn't have any real ownership. And Michael Jordan really changed the game, A, because he was willing to take on all the fines from using so much red in his basketball shoes, but B, because the performance, he got commission from the, the performance of the shoe. 
Um, so he sort of had an unlimited potential in terms of um, how much income he could get from those shoes. And some ambassadors even go as far to say as they want equity in the company itself. Um, so the whole game has changed since Michael Jordan. Um, and today we've got younger athletes who might get sponsorships at universities in the US, let's say. Um, and before, if they were a athlete at a university, the university would own the name, image and likeness and say what the athlete could and couldn't do. But the regulations have changed. So those athletes now own that name, image and likeness. So they can actually do these brand deals a lot younger. And some of these young athletes will become the stars of tomorrow. It's very difficult to predict who, um, but you can work with them at a lot younger age. The next form of influences we saw were the TV reality stars like Paris Hilton um, and the Kardashians who basically turned their homes and their private lives into a big brother, bringing in cameras and filming all aspects of their lives. And then we had Gen Z's who basically went ahead and did exactly the same things. They were documenting their lives, they were putting their lives on YouTube, um, but over time, they realized that they were disadvantaged with working with brands because brands had con creative control. Brands could determine what the price was. They always had to negotiate with these brands. So these influencers started to source their own products directly from manufacturers. And they got a lot healthier profit from doing that by going direct to the manufacturers. Um, then they started using social live selling um, and you've got some influencers here, which will literally show a product for three seconds and then move on to the next um, the next product and sell an absolute fortune. You can see some of the rec records in this. It's mainly in Asia Pacific, as opposed to uh, in Europe or the US, you don't really see live social selling as much. And what we'll see with AI now is we'll see a move towards live AI avatars. As these influencers get older and they move from being teenagers to being in their mid thirties, married with children, but still having this following, why not license out their name, image and likeness so that their younger self can stay young forever and um, cool and trendy and to continue to sell these products. Plus these AI avatars, you can have a digital, ver like. 15, 30, 100 different uh, digital versions of yourself, digital twins, who are all speaking in different languages and maybe even having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone. So you are effectively cloning yourself. So if you have limited time, here is your solution. Um, some of the influencers who, um, this is Grace Beverly, she's now in, in her 30s, um, she is now selling her own brand. Uh, then we've got virtual influencers like little Michaela, Iman. They're doing deals with, say, BMW. And then the last part is brand licensing. So brand licensing is where you take a brand, like a, an anime brand, um, and then you can create the merchandise. You can take the anime characters and, and these cartoon characters and bring them to real life. You can license fashion brands into games. This is Fortnite and Louis Vuitton. You can use motion capture to have um, realistic fashion shows in games in these virtual worlds. Um, Ready Player Me is experimenting with generative AI to, to customize your own clothes in these games. And then, of course, you've got licensing between different brands and collaboration. So this is Burberry and British Airways and various different brand collaborations. And young people love the novelty of these collaborations. You also have the emergence of memes. So this is an example of licensing a film franchise like Harry Potter and creating a really fun uh, meme for that. And then the last part is education. So where do we go from here? What are the jobs of the future? What are the skills of the future? I think that in, in future, pretty much every um, role will have AI in front of it. Um, 
And Stanford are doing this project called Gaia, where it's basically saying, okay, well, if we're going to have general artificial intelligence, these are the things that AI needs to be able to do, but can't do yet. So if you can look at the, the skills that AI can't do, if you are trying to um, future-proof your career, you should also look at areas where AI isn't particularly good and strengthen those skills. So as AI deplace, replaces some of your tasks and uh, parts of your role, you, you still have a job in the future. So it might be things around emotional intelligence, cultural sensitivity, um, manual things like being an artisan, all of those will still be really important. And that's it. So thank you so much for having me here today. Um, and I am open to any questions that you have. Yeah, I think we have a question here for you, Francesca. It's, is synthetic, synthetic data better for training? Um, it really depends. Um, so synthetic data, you need to create a, essentially a, a mirror of the real data set. Uh, and it's great in terms of reducing bias and for GDPR and privacy concerns. However, it's still very difficult to, you know, time consuming to create that synthetic data set. So it really depends on the use case and if you need the bias or not. Um, with the EU AI Act, you want to remove bias as much as possible. Um, however, if you're looking at marketing, and segmenting users, doing things like silicon sampling, bias is useful. If you're in precision medicine, so in the Middle East, they are gathering people's genetic material to create personalized medicine and train these models to create personalized medicine. That is an example of where bias is useful because if you are, say, a black woman and you are trying this medicine, in future, you can say, okay, well, has this medicine been tested on people where the very similar genetic makeup to me um, and genetics isn't just your DNA it's also maybe looking at where you live the conditions of, of how you live so you can you can predict um, if that medicine will work for you so I think synthetic data is, is highly tied to bias um, and and strategic con considerations around that yeah I think we have more questions for you here Great. Please pick one and, and ask me. <laughs> okay. Um, how will AI affect the fashion education scenario with reference to design process and forecast study? Um, so I think I touched on this a little bit. Um, so you can definitely use big data. Um, so you can use social media to forecast trends. Um, also personalize fashion a lot more so rather than having one single collection which is the trend of the season you can say okay well this demographic the these the the trends that this demographic are going to go for and this other one that they're going to be interested in this you might have smaller collections almost like capsule collections and you can also test out demand beforehand using generative ai so people can virtually try on things if they like it um, and if it suits them, not just if it looks good on some supermodel or Bollywood star or, you know, Kim Kardashian, because that often you will buy things looking at someone who doesn't look at all like you receive the clothes and then send it back because it doesn't suit you. So I think um, looking at design and trends will be all about using big data and also A-B testing as much as possible with virtual try-ons. Okay, one more. What are the current limitations of AI in fashion, particularly in areas such as understanding complex fashion concepts and styles? So I think one of the main issues that I've come across with the fashion AI community is AI can create some really complex designs, sort of highly detailed, hot couture, 3D printed elements. Whereas the reality is if you were today to try and create your own garment and maybe go to a print on demand site, you could create a t-shirt with a logo on it, something very simple and standardized. And in order to get to that level of complexity, you still need the couturiers that are in these fashion houses in Paris and know how to do all this needlework and know how to do these complex things. So 
the, the difficulty is we don't have enough artisans and I think we'll need more artisans in future. We need, we need to protect those um, handcrafts as much as possible. And yes, we'll have robots who can do some of it, but a vast majority of, of that work won't be possible without artisans. Okay, one more very interesting question. How can AI be used to reduce the waste generation from the garment industry? How to combine AI and fashion without harm to the society? Um, so people talk about like fast fashion and slow fashion as if fast fashion is bad, it's overconsumption, it's all these cheap materials, you know, coming out of China and it's a race to the bottom. That can be true in some senses if you're, you know, buying all these like really cheap materials from say Primark with Lycra and, um, um, you know, things that aren't going to last for a long time. They might last for a couple of months and then they've got a hole in it and you're going to throw it away. Um, so materials is a, a really important one and quality, but fast fashion doesn't have to mean bad quality. Fast fashion can mean um, responding to trends more accurately and it can in fact be more sustainable than slow fashion that predicts what the fashion is going to be a year in advance um, and then has these fashion shows and puts the fashion in magazines to say this is the trend um, because it says so so I think it, it's kind of a, a mix between both worlds so the high quality of the luxury fashion brands and the the data uh, responsiveness and real timeness of um, the fast fashion world. If you can combine those two things, then you actually get to a sustainable outcome. Okay, last one. Adaptation of AI in fashion industry, hairstyle transfer, GANS, use uh, GANS and advancement through vision LLM usage with these advancements, what do we see in next one two years in fashion industry? Um, I'm not sure if I totally understand your question, but if you're talking about you know image GANs, um, so I worked at Move AI who do things like pose estimation, um, and and motion capture. So you know, imagine you've got a mirror with computer vision and it does pose estimation. So you can be standing in front of a mirror and you can start to see clothes um, virtually on yourself. Those could be real products that then you can click your supercomputer mirror and say, I want to buy this right now. Or it could say the shop is around the corner, you can go there. Or it could be a generative AI piece that doesn't exist yet and you could just use voice activation so this is multimodal AI where you say I want a black mini dress and you can see it straight away and then you can say no I want it longer and it can adapt that so that's like an image GAN with virtual try-ons with computer vision with smart mirror technology and the real impact is when you start to combine all of these things together to create that full experience but it's going to take a long long time um to get there hopefully sooner rather than later but I, I think that's when things will become really exciting when we've got smart mirrors oh, wonderful uh, okay a heartfelt thank you to Francesca for this insightful session and a big round of applause for all of you who have joined us today and participated actively before you. you leave we are eager to hear your feedback on today's session Please take a moment to fill out our quick NPS survey. Your response are incredibly valuable and will help us improve in our future webinars. Thank you so much. Please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. And uh, yes, thank you for listening. While you fill the pool, let me give you an introduction to what we do at E2E Networks. E2E Network Limited is an India AI forced hyperscaler from India, focusing on providing advanced cloud GPU Infrastructure, we lead the in industry as a prominent cloud GPU provider, offering comprehensive range of NVIDIA GPUs, including HDX H100, A100, L40S, and L4. To know more about us, you can check out our website, e2enetworks.com, or if you want to get your hands on one of our GPU, you can sign up at myaccount.e2enetworks.com. I'll be posting both the links in the chat box for your reference. Thank you, everyone. 
that's all from us today. We hope you found this webinar valuable. Stay tuned for more such events. From Eto Networks, have a wonderful week.